The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Question Live. We're happy to have you here tonight. Tonight's topic is reproductive. And leading our session once again is Dr. Faris Vakari, and he's going to introduce himself to you now. Faris. Thank you, Sean. Hey, guys, my name is Paris. I'm a uh, currently working in dermatology, and I'm also an RX coach with USMLE RX. So I work one-on-one -on -one with students such as you guys to help prepare you all for the USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK as well. And I'm happy to help lead tonight's session. So I know I mentioned the RX coach earlier. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. But what I do want you guys to know right now is that the methodology that we're going to employ as we dissect these four questions is very similar to the methodology that we use in RX Coach. So with that, let's go ahead and get into our first question of the evening on the topic of reproductive. As you can see, the answer choices are covered up. That is by design. We do that because we don't want you to have your thought process be guided or dictated by the answer choices. And we don't want you to see an answer choice that you may be unfamiliar with, which may cause you to panic as you're trying to answer the question on test day. So the answer choices are covered up. And once we cover those up, we like to start with the lead in or the question itself, which is the last sentence. And the reason we do that is because we want you to know what the test writer is asking before you read the vignette so that you can pick up on all those relevant clues and have and, and, and avoid having to reread that question on test day and, and waste valuable time. So let's take a look at that lead in together. Which of the following is the most likely finding in this patient? Which of the following is the most likely finding in this patient? Once we read that lead in, we'd like to ask our students how many steps this question will require. An example of a one step question could be where you're asked for the diagnosis. An example of a two step question could be where you're asked for the treatment for a diagnosis. And an example of a three step question is when you're asked for the mechanism for a treatment for a diagnosis. So with that in mind, please let us know in the question box how many steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll move on to that vignette. And the reason we do that is because we want you to have an organized thought process so that you stay consistent and don't make any careless mistakes, but also so that you answer the right question on test day. I see the responses coming in. Let's take a look at that vignette. A 17 year old boy is brought to the clinic because he has not developed signs of puberty and has behavior problems at school. He has erections, but does not ejaculate. Vital signs are normal. Physical examination shows a tall height for age, no body hair, small penis, small firm testes, and mild gynecomastia. The prolactin level is normal and luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone levels are increased. Which of the following is the most likely finding in this patient? I want all of you to start thinking about the important clues in the vignette and lead-in as I hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and show you what we think are those important clues in the vignette and the leading. So starting off, generally, you know, the first thing you're going to get are demographics. In this case, we're told this is a 17-year-old boy. Okay, so automatically we can start to think of uh, certain things um, that this question might be getting at. Okay, so you want to make note of those demographics, and then you want to make note of why is he coming in uh, to see the doctor, to the clinic, to the ER. And in this case, it's because he has not developed signs of puberty and has behavioral problems at school, okay? So those are what we call presenting signs and symptoms, okay? Now, in this case, they didn't tell us how long it's going on for. So sometimes they'll say, hey, this is going on for a couple days, a couple years. So you get a sense of the chronicity of the condition. So you would want to make note of that as well. Now, in this case, they also tell us about uh, some very important um, other uh, pertinent history as well as some very important physical exam findings and lab findings, okay? Um, so you want to make note of that and hopefully you can all tie these together because remember this is asking us about the most likely finding in this patient. So I think we've got a couple steps here. I think one, we've got to figure out what is the condition, what is the diagnosis, um, and then two, what is another finding we would see in that patient? So I think we've got a two-step question here. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at those answer choices. And once again, um, you know, when we work with students and we go through the answer choices that we actually recommend starting at the bottom and working your way up to the top. So starting with answer choice E and going up to answer choice A. Okay, and the reason we do this is because a lot of times we'll see students who start at the top, they'll select something they like, 
um, and they'll select that answer without going through all the answer choices. So sometimes they'll get that question wrong as a result. So we recommend doing it this way to prevent yourself from making that mistake. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's do that now. Answer choice E, fibrosis of the seminiferous tubules. D, decreased gonadotropin releasing hormone. C, decreased follicle stimulating hormone. B, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And A, cellular resistance to testosterone. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you, Parth. The poll is open. Remember that, as always, we do have a special offer and a raffle at the end. You must stick around because you must be present to win, so maybe you'll be our lucky winner tonight. We'll give all of you a few moments here to lock in your answers. I see the responses coming in. We'll give all of you a few more moments. A little over half of you have responded. Remember that there is no penalty for guessing on test day, so you should never leave a question blank. If you're at a loss, just take your best guess. All right, let's take a look and see what all of you selected. Well, 30... 5% of you was second choice, we had E. Number one with 37% was answer choice D. Let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is indeed E, and 35% of you got it right, so it was our second, it was in second place tonight. Let me go ahead and hand it off to Boris. Thank you, Sean. Let's take a look at this question, okay? So this is definitely a tough question, all right? So this 17-year-old boy has a couple abnormalities that we picked up on right off the bat, okay? Gynecomastia and increased LH and FSH, okay? Now, importantly, this patient has not developed pubertal signs of genital and testicular enlargement. The patient is, also does not have body hair or pubic hair. So this all suggests that the patient has primary hypogonadism due to testicular failure. So primary hypogonadism, okay? And without any history of trauma, any other medical illnesses, a genetic disorder is thus most likely, and the most common of these is Klinefelter syndrome, okay? So if we take a look, at the next slide, we can take a look at Klinefelter syndrome, okay? And you can see here that this is um, a chromosomal disorder, and patients present with small, firm testes. They are often tall with increased uh, bone length. Gynec they would have gynecomastia. They would also, as you can see there, have increased LH and FSH on the right. And as you can see, the reason they have increased FSH is because of dysgenesis of the seminiferous tubules, okay? Which is essentially what answer choice E was, okay? So if we go back to our question, you can see now why answer choice E is the best answer, okay? So Klinefelter syndrome can lead to fibrosis of the seminiferous tubules and thus uh, would lead to increased FSH and also LH as well, okay? And because of that, you have excess gonadotropins, which in turn increase estrogen levels and thus can cause gynecomastia, okay? Now, the other answer choices, in case you selected that, decreased GNRH, that is also known as Kalman syndrome, where you have absent puberty, an impaired sense of smell or anosmia, Decreased FSH, that would be seen in some patients with a prolactinoma, for example. Uh, we are told the prolactin level cure is normal. Answer choice B, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, that is also a genetic enzyme deficiency. Most types result in female genitalia. Um, sorry, most types of CH where you have virilizing symptoms um, uh, of, of CH. You can also have 17-alpha uh, hydroxylase deficiency. Uh, where you would show female type genitalia in a male patient, 
but you would also have hypertension and high mineral corticoids. So kind of ruling out an adrenal cause here. And then lastly, answer choice A, cellular resistance to testosterone. This is also known as androgen insensitivity syndrome, where you have complete insensitivity or partial insensitivity to androgen. So you have high testosterone levels. Patients would look female with under virilization and infertility, but they would have female external genitalia, blind vaginas, um, a little bit different than what this patient has. So the best answer choice here is answer choice E. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Definitely a challenging question. Reproductive tends to be challenging for most students, which is why we're tackling it tonight. Let's move on now to our second question of the evening. Once again, the answer choices are covered up. That is by design. And as always, we'll begin with that lead in. If present in this patient's history, which of the following would most predispose the patient to her likely diagnosis? If present in this patient's history, which of the following would most predispose the patient to her likely diagnosis? I'll give all of you a few more moments here to respond in the question box and let us know any steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll take a look at that vignette. All right, a few more seconds here. Great, I see some responses coming in. Let's take a look at that vignette. A 29-year-old woman at seven weeks of gestation presents to the office with sharp pains in her lower abdomen and vaginal bleeding. Physical examination reveals a closed non-tender cervix and mild right adnexal tenderness with no appreciable mass. Transvaginal ultrasound shows an empty uterus and no adnexal masses. Beta human chorionic gonadotropin level is 1,700. One week, one week later, or beta HCG level is 2,100. If present in this patient's history, which of the following would most predispose the patient to her likely diagnosis? Bars. Thank you, Sean. So now we're going to take a look at what we think the important uh, clues in this vignette and lead in are. Okay, so now we've got a 29-year-old woman. All right. And right off the bat, they tell us a little, little bit about her gestation and that she's seven weeks of gestation. So automatically, we kind of know what question this is. Um, whenever they give you something like that about gestation right off the bat, definitely want to make note of that. You don't want to forget that important clue, okay? Now, she is coming in because she has sharp pains in her lower abdomen and vaginal bleeding, okay? Those are her presenting signs and symptoms. We don't really know how long it's been going on for them. So in this patient who has vaginal bleeding and who's pregnant, you want to make a note of a lot of things on physical exam. Is there an exal tenderness? Um, what is your physical exam of the abdomen and uterus show and the cervic, cervical exam? Um, they did an ultrasound examination here as well. What does that show? What are her laboratory findings, especially the HCG level show? Those are all things that we kind of highlighted because those are going to be important to pick up on what's going on in this question. Okay. Now this question is asking us, if present in the patient's history, what would most predispose the patient to her likely diagnosis? So I think we've got kind of got to work backwards here a little bit. I think one, we've got to figure out what is this patient's most likely diagnosis? And then two, what are some things that would predispose the patient to that diagnosis if it was in her history? So I think we've got to know one, the diagnosis, and two, some predisposing factors or risk factors, okay? So let's go ahead and let's take a look at those answer choices once again. Start at the bottom and work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, salpingitis. D, prior hydatiform mole. C, more than five prior births. B, history of miscarriage. A, diabetes mellitus. Once again, we'll go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the best answer, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Well, excellent. Thank you, Paris. Once again, the poll is open. And as always, we'll wait until about two-thirds of you have responded. Looks like there's already a clear favorite.
And once again, you know, a lot of students are responding with their answers in the question box. Feel free to submit your response via the poll. All right, let's take a look and see what you selected. 52% of you selected answer choice E, and in distant second place, we had answer choice D. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. Sorry for the technical difficulties here today. All right. And the correct answer is indeed E, and 52% of you got it right. So great job, everyone. Let me hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, great job with this question, guys. So let's take a look at what's going on, OK? So this pre presentation of this patient is pretty classic for an ectopic pregnancy. That's when you have implantation uh, anywhere other than the normal endometrial sites, OK? most common site, as we know, is the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Typical presenting signs include amenorrhea, lower abdominal pain, and vaginal bleeding. Okay. Now, if we look at this patient's HCG levels, we can see that it is continuing to rise. One week, or it was initially 1,700. One week later, it was 2,100, so it's still rising. Okay. Now, it's not rising by a crazy amount. It's not more than doubling, but it is still rising. Okay. We also know there is nothing in the uterus. There is an empty uterus, okay? So there is no intrauterine gestational sac. All things that kind of confirm what we're thinking, that this is most likely an ectopic pregnancy, okay? So let's take a look at the next slide. Let's take a look at see what first aid has to say about ectopic pregnancies. And you can see, as mentioned, it is an implantation in a site other than the uterus, okay? What are some risk factors? The second sentence in that first paragraph, tubal pathologies, okay? So scarring from salpingitis or pelvic inflammatory disease. If you have any sort of scarring in that tube, it is possible that that fertilized ovum may not make its way all the way down the tube and implant in the uterus. Kind of uh, what you can see in that diagram on the left side, of a normal pregnancy is that fertilized ovum makes its way all the way through the fallopian tube and implants in the uterus. And on the right side of that image, you can see there what would happen in an ectopic pregnancy. It just does not make its way into the uterus. And as mentioned, one of the risk factors is any sort of tubal pathology, along with a prior ectopic pregnancy and IUD or IVF as well. Okay. So if we go back to our uh, question, we can take a look um, to see uh, what the other answer choices were in case you selected that. So answer choice D, prior hydatiform mole, that's a risk factor for molar pregnancy. So maybe that's what you were thinking of. But remember, that would show much higher HCG levels, often greater than 100,000. And usually you would see something on ultrasound, like a uterine mass. Answer choice C, more than five prior births, births, that increases the risk of gestational diabetes or pregnancy hypertension, a little bit different. History of miscarriage, that increases the risk of subsequent miscarriage, okay? Not so much ectopic, the development of an ectopic pregnancy. Lastly, answer choice A, diabetes, malaise, that uh, causes increased risk of birth defects and macrosomia or large baby, uh, but not the development of uh, an ectopic pregnancy as mentioned. So like you guys selected, the best answer choice here is E. Well, thank you very much, Pars. Great job, everyone. You know, when you're studying, oftentimes, you know, we, we, we talk to students and they're like, oh, my friend said to do this, or I read this on Reddit, or I read this on, you know, a forum, and it turns out that their progress doesn't really line up with their efforts, right? And a lot of that happens because as much as your friends want you to succeed and as great as the advice you may be receiving on the internet, it may not be pertinent to you because we are also different. We learn differently. We think differently. We apply what we know differently. And we all have different strengths and weaknesses. Here at Rx Coach, what we do is we create a personalized study plan based on your strengths and your weaknesses. We help you identify your strengths and your weaknesses. We work with you on your test taking skills, which is why 
every student who's come to us has been successful and accomplished their goals. And we hope that if you need your help, you'll reach out to us as well. Whether you're already doing great and want to do better, or you're simply just not where you want to be, or if you're finding yourself struggling with certain topics and you're telling yourself, you know, my results just aren't matching my efforts, reach out to us at rx-coach.com. Let us take the guesswork out of state and put you on a plan for success and use the over 30 years of data that we have to really, you know, use those expertise and, and make your studying more efficient and help you maximize your potential. So if you're interested in Rx Coach, reach out to us at rx-coach.com. Click on the free consultation tab and we can talk about the program and how it can benefit you. We can, we can tutor you for you know, med school subjects while you're still in school, for shelf exams, for board exams. We're here for it all. So once again, that's rx-coach.com. Feel free to set up that free consultation and talk about the program and how it can benefit you. So with that, let's go ahead and move on now to our third question of the evening. Keep in mind that we do have a raffle and you must be present to win. One of you will win a very valuable prize. As always, the answer choices are covered up, and we will begin with that leading. Which of the following additional findings is most likely in this patient? Which of the following additional findings is most likely in this patient? As always, we'll give you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe the question will require, and then we'll move on to that vignette. See some responses coming in. We'll give all of you a couple more seconds here. All right, let's take a look at that vignette. A 17 year old girl presents to the physician because the patient has not begun menstruating. On examination, the patient has a blind end vagina without a cervix. The patient has two small masses in the labia majora. Serum studies show an elevated serum testosterone level. Which of the following additional findings is most likely in this patient, Boris? Thank you, Sean. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in. Okay, so we've got a 17-year-old girl. It's okay, so a little bit of a pediatrics case. And she's coming in because she has not begun menstruating, even though she's 17 years old. Those are her presenting signs and symptoms. So obviously, in these uh, patients where you have amenorrhea, we want to figure out What's the cause of it? So you want to make sure you're doing a good examination, you're checking appropriate lab tests. In this case, there are some things that they tell us. So we want to make note of those physical exam findings and lab findings. Now this question is asking us about an additional finding most likely. So I think one, we've got to figure out based on those few clues in the sentence or in the vignette, uh, what is the diagnosis? And then two, what is an additional finding that we might see in this patient? So I think a nice two-step question here. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at those answer choices. Once again, we will start at the bottom and then we'll work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, reduced dihydrotestosterone. D, female breast development. C, excess body hair. B, 47XXY genotype. And A, 45XO genotype. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the best answer and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent, thank you, Paris. The poll is open. I see some responses coming in. If you have suggestions on which topics you'd like us to cover, please feel free to let us know in the question box. We'd love to hear from you. I see about a quarter of you have voted so far. A few more moments here. Seems to be pretty close here between first and second place. All righty, let's take a look and see what you selected. So 32% of you selected C, excess body hair in second place with 26%. We had female breast development. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is D, female breast development and 26% of you got it right. So definitely a challenging question. Let's pay attention to Boris now so we can all master this topic, Boris. 
Thank you, Sean. Yes, definitely another tough reproductive question, okay? They love asking questions about amenorrhea, and it's a tough, tough topic. So let's, let's walk through this one, okay? So this patient likely has what's called androgen insensitivity syndrome, okay? So the patient is unresponsive to the, um, sorry, the patient's testosterone receptors are unresponsive to androgens, okay? So even though this patient um, is male in terms of chromosomes, so 46XY, okay, they often have female appearing external genitalia. Okay, and how that would manifest is a blind ending vagina without a cervix. Okay, so that means there's no cervix, there's no uterus um, in this patient. So this patient who was initially thought to be a 17 year old girl, if they have never had chromosomal studies, is actually probably 46 XY. Okay, now those two small masses in the labia majora are probably undescended testes. Okay. And so the reason this patient was uh, uh, told us to be 17 year old girls because at birth, sex assignment is usually most often female because they have external female appearing genitalia, okay? So if we take a look at the next slide, we can take a look to, at uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome. And you can see that this results in female appearing genetic uh, males or 46 XY, okay? female external genitalia with the rudimentary vagina, meaning they do not have a uterus, they do not have fallopian tubes, okay? And another thing that this patient might have is a female habitus, female breast development as well, okay? And the reason is because the body, uh, the testosterone receptors are insensitive to androgens, so you would have, um, through negative feedback, you would have an a rise in LH. And because of that, you have high testosterone and usually converted to estrogen via aromatization. Okay, so that's why this patient might develop female appearing breasts. So if we go back to our question and the other answer choices, hopefully you can see why answer choice D is the best answer here. The other answer choices, answer choice E, for example, reduced DH, uh, DHT, that describes 5 alpha reductase deficiency. So patients can't convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Um, and this leads to ambiguous genitalia until puberty, at which point the increase in testosterone leads to masculine genitalia. So this patient at 17 uh, would, would then have more masculine appearing genitalia. Answer choice C, excess body hair. That is more if the patient were to be a uh, female, uh, 45, uh, XX, and they have virilization, okay? so. Um, not the best answer there. Uh, answer choice B, once again, as we talked about previously, that's Klinefelter syndrome, uh, where you have a male phenotype with small penis, infertility. Um, answer choice A, that's describing Turner syndrome, which as we know is a little bit different as well, phenotypically, so the best answer choice here, like you guys, so, uh, like 26% of you guys picked, is answer choice D. Well, thank you very much, Parth. Definitely a challenging question. Let's try to finish strong now with our last question of the evening on the topic of reproductive. Next week's topic for those of you who are asking is going to be high yield first year med school. So we're gonna pick out some topics that were high yield from when you started med, med school or, or if you're starting now, five topics that you'll likely see soon. So make sure you join us next week for that. The last question of the evening. Once again, the answer choices are covered up and we will begin with that lead in. Which of the following is most likely to be seen in this patient? Which of the following is most likely to be seen in this patient? We'll give all of you a few moments here to respond in the question box and let us know how many steps you believe this question will require. And then we'll move on to that vignette. A few more moments here. All right, let's take a look at that vignette. A 52-year-old woman comes to the office for an annual examination. She is clinically obese, nulliparous, and still menstruating. Physical examination reveals a red scaly patch on her right nipple and palpable axillary nodes. 
Palpation reveals a firm mass in her right breast and serosanguineous discharge from the right nipple. Which of the following is most likely to be seen in this patient? Once again, we want all of you to start thinking about the important clues in the vignette and lead-in as I hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. So once again, we're going to go ahead and walk you through these important clues. And, you know, this is our fourth time doing this through these reproductive questions. So hopefully you guys are picking up on, you know, what are those clues in those vignettes and those lead-ins uh, with these reproductive type questions, okay? Now, in this case, we've got a 52-year-old woman, and she just has uh, an annual examination coming up. That's why she's here, okay? But we are told about some of her uh, reproductive history. And we are told about an abnormal physical exam, okay? She's got uh, a dermatologic issue on her right nipple. She's got some lymphadenopathy, a mass in her breast, some drainage, all abnormal things, okay? So you want to make sure that you're picking up on all of those because you don't want to miss any of those clues that could clue you into the right diagnosis. And then the question is asking us, what's most likely to be seen? So I think one, like uh, some of our previous questions, we've got to come up with the right diagnosis here. And then two, what else could be seen in this patient? So I think we've got another nice two-step question. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at those answer choices. Once again, we will start at the bottom and we will work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, solid pattern with central necrosis. D, lymphocytic infiltration. C, linear cells within breast stroma. B, large cells with clear halos. And A, fibrovascular structures lined by ductal epithelium. So we're going to go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select what you think is the best answer here, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paris. This is our last question of the evening on the topic of reproductive. And then, of course, we do have our raffle and special offer. But let's try to finish strong here. I see the responses coming in. Seems to be seems to be tied. First place is tied, and second place is also tied. So let's take a look. About half of you have submitted your responses so far. We'll give all of you a few more moments here. All righty, well, let's take a look and see what you selected. And we have, I think for the first time in Question Lab history, a three-way tie for first place. So 28% of you selected A, 28% of you selected B, and 28% of you selected answer choice D. So let's take a look and see what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is B, so it was one of the three that was tied for first place. Let me hand it off to Paris. Thank you, Sean. Yes, definitely a tough question. And, um, you know, definitely some, some good other answer choices there as well. But the key here is picking up on the correct answer. And once you can get that first step, then, you know, that second step obviously becomes a little bit more straightforward. So let's kind of figure out what that first step was. What was the diagnosis here? Okay. This patient has a diagnosis, most likely, of Paget's disease of the breast. This is where patients have a eczematous patch on their nipple, okay? And usually an underlying mass within the breast as well. So if we go to, um, actually, um, we'll go to the uh, two slides forward from now. Um, and this is first looking at Paget's disease, okay? This is um, basically when you have an eczematous patch over the nipple or the skin near the nipple. And basically what it's implying is that there's an underlying cancer underneath, which is why the patient in this situation had a firm mass in the breast as well. And we call it Paget's disease because Paget cells are basically uh, when you kind of have cell cancerous cells within the epidermis. So if we go back one slide, we take a look at the histology of Paget's disease. We've got these little cancerous cells that are surrounded by halos, okay? And these are called paget, uh, uh, pagetoid scatter, pagetoid cells. You can see it in actually a couple conditions, um, Paget's disease of the breast, um, uh, sebaceous carcinoma, um, uh, uh, 
melanoma as well. So a couple things that can cause this pagetoid scatter, but obviously when we're dealing with the breast, the most likely thing is Paget's disease of the breast. Okay, so this is what you would see on histology, and this is definitely a, a high yield histolo histologic image that they could ask you about, okay? So let's go back to the other answer choices in case you selected that, uh, one of the other answer choices. Answer choice E, solid pattern with central necrosis. That's getting at comedocarcinoma, uh, which kind of feels more cord-like. You can express some uh, cheese cord-like material. Answer choice D, lymphocytic infiltration. That's more of a medullary carcinoma, which is more like a well-circumscribed uh, soft mass. Answer choice C, linear cells within breast stroma. That's uh, kind of consistent with an infiltrating lobular carcinoma, which are uh, usually bilateral as well. Um, and lastly, answer choice A is characterizing an introductal papilloma. Um, now remember, none of those other answer choices really have that presentation of a red scaly or eczematous patch near the nipple. Um, so those other answer choices kind of already don't even uh, fit that clinical presentation. So definitely some tough questions here on the tough topic of reproductive, but great job on these questions. And we'll pass it back to you, Sean. Well, thank you very much, Boris, and great job as always. We're always happy to have Boris and our wonderful coaches with us. If you would like to review these questions in, on your own time in more detail to make sure you understood all of the key concepts today, feel free to take a screenshot, a picture, or make note of these QIDs. You can simply type these into the Rx search field within USMLE Rx, and it'll pull it right up for you. So I'll give all of you a few moments here to make notes. <laughs> 